Welcome back. This is Lesson 10, Case Study 2008 Financial Meltdown. The purpose of this lesson is to understand how economic deregulation caused a financial meltdown, and therefore we are putting to test the neoliberal, neoconservative, Reaganomic, Thatcheristic, Thatcherism, Milton Friedman, Hayek-inspired return back to classic liberalism response to Keynesian economics that we've been studying in the past. And if all that made sense, bravo to you. If not, that's okay. It'll make better sense when we're done this lesson. So one of the first things we see here is a 12-minute video on the crisis of credit. If you haven't watched the crisis of credit, if you are a student that has no background on how economic deregulation caused the financial meltdown of 2008, the YouTube video Crisis of Credit is a must-watch. Now, here's the thing. It is going to go into things like financial derivatives and credit default swaps that are well beyond the high school level. So I don't need you to memorize all of the banking terms and all the math behind it. What I need you to do is understand how deregulation created an opportunity to expose that irrational mankind can destabilize an industry. And in this case, it destabilized the financial industry. Now, in defense of the financial industry, we have this quote here. Finance has been the crucial ladder in the making of the modern world, and all ladders are precarious, but without them, it is hard to build anything. So that is a quote saying that, you know, like any other ladder, finance and the financial industry is prone to be precarious, but we still need them. So we're not saying let's totally scrap the financial sector. What we are saying is perhaps it needs to be regulated, much like following the 1929 meltdown of the stock market. Eventually, in 1933, regulations were part of the New Deal. So $6.9 trillion of value was wiped off the global marketplace in 2008, the largest fall in history. For perspective's sake, in 1989, there was a Black Monday where half a trillion dollars of value was lost. So we do have a link here that uh, looks at some of the biggest days in uh, in. Dow Jones history in terms of how quickly they've fallen. 7% um, drop in 2001 with the uh, the bubble burst of the dot-com industry. NASDAQ dropped by 9%. Uh, we can update this. You know, this year in 2020, this March, we saw the um, coronavirus, the COVID-19, uh, create a 10% correction in the stock market as well. But what we're seeing here with the Dow Jones plummeting in 2008 is and was was larger. So, perspective. But we can see here by the UK growth that although there is an economic downturn, that it will lead to um, prolonged economic growth. So there is some hope. Here's the Great Recession by some numbers. 31.8% housing prices fell in the United States. Obviously, that's a, a federal average or a national average, so there'll be some areas affected even more. It's always good to collect some numbers so that uh, in your evidence in A2, in essay writing, you can be as precise as possible. We have another link that if you, after you watch the crisis of credit and you're like, you know, I still don't understand what caused the global financial crisis, we have this here. Caused by deregulation of the financial industry, which permitted banks to engage in hedge fund trading. Uh, so it allowed banks to uh, purchase and promote um, basically poor investments, some some. Um, subprime real estate was was uh, provided. Subprime mortgages were provided in the sense that people were not prime candidates to receive a mortgage. Uh, banks eventually demanded more mortgages. It creates this subprime uh, real estate bubble that will end up creating a financial crisis. So if you didn't understand the crisis of credit video, this is probably much more concise, right? Probably an easier way to look at that. 
and then it goes into the deed regulation. The deed regulation. So the 1999 Graham Leak Billy Act, also known as the Financial Services Modernization Act, repealed the Glass Steagall Act of 1933. When you start having like um, evidence like that, now it becomes very precise, right? It wasn't just deregulation. This is the very specific deregulation that caused the financial meltdown. So definitely a, a good link to see um, more. If you're trying to go from a PF to to an E from 80 to 100, if you're trying to get more precise, this link here will tell you that precise information. There's some cartoons that explore the uh, you know who's at fault, and now obviously this cartoonist is making fun of the fact that in America uh, corporations were at fault, but but poor people were being um, villainized as the source of, of the problem. Um, there's another video on the causes of the Great Recession. This one's much shorter and simplified compared to that crisis of credit one. And obviously Wikipedia will have some stuff too. In a related note, some could be asking or were asking a year ago, is another global recession beginning to loom? And uh, they couldn't foresee COVID-19 a year ago, but now because of COVID-19, we are in a part of a global recession for sure. From a neoconservative perspective, poverty is not the result of financiers exploiting the poor. It has much more to do with the lack of financial institutions, not, not the presence, or sorry, not the absence of banks, but, the, or sorry, it's the absence of banks, not the presence of banks that causes the problem. I think that this quote really allows us to look at the nature of mankind. Far from being a monster that must be put in its place, financial markets are like the mirror of mankind, revealing every hour of every working day the way we value ourselves and the resources of the world around us. So the 2008 financial meltdown uh, is really a reflection of the irrational and greedy nature of mankind. So some good quotes there. Some of the controversy surrounding this case study lies with the connection that it had with the government response to it. And uh, what we see here is, is a the United States government uh, being shown as Uncle Sam giving out bailouts. But who are they giving it out to? Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Banks and the Big Three, and the AIG, which is the American group of in investment companies. And, and who's not in the breadline would be the American people. So corporations were receiving bailout packages while families were not. And many people in America felt very critical to this government policy that seemed to be coming to the aid of Wall Street corporations that had political connections and not coming to the aid of Main Street, those individuals who may have been um, forced to leave their homes because they were bankrupt. There's a bit of an article on that for you. Now, not that I'm going to defend the actions of the Bush administration, uh, but much of those bailouts have been have been returned to the government, and some have actually generated profit. So there were 985 corporations, and the link is above that. You can see the entire list if you wish. And this is how much money was dispersed to them, and this is how much money has been returned back. And you can see this number is less than that. But because they also bought um, they, they got shareholders, right? Like, so the government became a shareholder of many of these corporations. This is how much money that they have also made from revenue of being shareholders or interest on those loans. So now they've actually made money. The government of the United States, from their corporate bailout, these numbers show they've actually made money. This one company alone, Fannie Mae, this is how much was dispersed. But not only did they get that money back, but the government has also reaped in excess of $68 billion net profit. Not a bad investment. So this cartoon is being um, critical 
of the government bailout, suggesting that it's just robbing taxpayers of money, whereas the data up here seems to suggest that the cartoonist is wrong, that it was a sound investment. Just some other cartoons on the same topic. Here's another cartoon questioning the bailouts of Wall Street. The same people that wanted deregulation and freedom from government in the 80s are now wanting freedom through government. We have this cartoon from the perspective of Das Kapital carrying Karl Marx saying, I told you so. I told you that capitalism would crumble, that uh, you know, selfish individualism is no foundation for a society. House of cards, bubbles, everything that's, you know, this is our most popular financial model. It's, it's not built to last, right? So a related term is austerity. Now, austerity is the practice of trying to, you know, eliminate the culture of dependence and cut spending to the extent that you can balance your budget. So many nations in the world, including Canada, unfortunately Alberta's in this situation as a province, we have debt. We are deficit financing. Our, our governments are spending more each fiscal term than they're bringing in. And as that debt uh, accumulates, it becomes a burden that we're passing to generations yet to be born. And some are suggesting that that's the wrong thing to do. It's intergenerational tyranny. So the solution is to practice austerity. We need to be more fiscally conservative, fiscally responsible. We need to cut spending on things that are not necessary or things that perhaps have created that culture of dependence. So austerity cuts often include cuts to health care and education and therefore can be quite controversial. Here's a cartoon talking about those cuts. So with these cartoons and with these other sources, you should be trying to find ideological perspectives. And those cuts in, the, in, in Europe, those austerity cuts in Europe, have, at, have inspired many people to ask, are we putting banks over people? You know, why are we cutting spending on people at the same time we're bailing out banks? So there's lots of topic around austerity and you know, who should the government be supporting? All right. So ladies and gentlemen, that, my friends, uh, is a look at the financial meltdown. Another topic of concern here before we wrap up economics would be Chapter 12 of the textbook. So Chapter 12 of the textbook gets very little love, very little attention on the diploma exam, but there are still some very important topics in it. And one of them is how environmentalism is a challenge to modern economic liberalism. And I would suggest to you that maybe environmentalism is the ultimate challenge because the ecological impact created by classic economic and now modern economic liberalism is not sustainable. And eventually, there will need to be a paradigm shift back away from individualism towards collectivism if the ecological common good becomes a goal that we're trying to protect. So chapter 12 is a chapter, uh, I believe I even told you not to do the, the, the worksheets on, the chapter questions. But do skim through it, and I want you to think back to Social 10. Think about that paradigm shift that we talked about in 10. Think about the, the viability, the sustainability of this paradigm and the, the challenge that capitalism and selfish economic individualism presents to the biosphere. And try to collect some, some raw data, some numbers that show the, the ecological footprint, right? the impact of our economic lives. How many species are in decline? How many species are endangered? You know, what is the um, spread of desertification and climate chaos and climate change and all of those great things? So that's something you can do for a little bit of homework, is to look at environmentally, how is it that capitalism is flawed? Have a good day.